abides in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Don't you care? That's a harsh indictment. Almost every parent has heard those words from someone they love very much. Don't you care? Don't you care that I'm the only one of my friends that doesn't have a cell phone? <laughs> Don't you care that I want to do something else? Don't you care that you're ruining my life? And the speaker of these words really believes it. It's just a different way of saying, I'm not sure that you love me. This is not the only place that these words of indictment are used, don't you care? Don't you care about the 795 million people around the world who do not have enough food every day for a healthy life? Don't you care that there are 3,000 abortions performed in America every day? Or on the other side of that ledger, don't you care about a woman's right to choose? Don't you care about 10,000 homeless in Minnesota, many of them youth? Don't you care about the world that you are leaving to your children and your grandchildren? Don't you care about the thousands of Christians who are being persecuted, even killed around the world for their faith in Jesus Christ? Don't you care? So are you feeling guilty enough? Did Jesus feel guilty when asked by his disciples, don't you care? This incident that we have read from Mark is early in Jesus' interaction with his disciples, only the fourth chapter of Mark. Surely earlier in Mark, in chapters 1 and 2, he has called a few disciples, four fishermen and a guy named Levi or Matthew, but it is not until the third chapter that he actually appoints these as his apostles. Third chapter, we are now in the fourth chapter. Evidently, the disciples don't know Jesus all that well. They have seen him perform some miracles, heal people. They have seen him cast out demons and heard some of his astounding teaching, especially in parables. But evidently, they have not been in a storm together, at least not until a long day, and Jesus suggests they go to the other side. The other side of what? The other side of the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is a large body of water surrounded by hills, but get this, it is 600 feet below sea level. The Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level and is not so much a sea the way we might think of a sea, the North Sea or the Baltic Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. It is really more a large lake. As a comparison, you could fit four of the Sea of Galilee within Minnesota's Lake Mille Lacs. So it is a large lake, and one of its features is with the hills, the winds come whipping over the hills down into this bowl of water 600 feet below the, surf, uh, below the sea level, and it creates sudden windstorms or squalls. The disciples and Jesus got caught in these windstorms more than once in the Gospels. One time, Jesus comes walking on the water in the dark of the night through one of those storms, and they are terrified. But the incident we have today, Jesus is already in the boat. He is tired after a long day of teaching and the crowds. Inexplicably, when a windstorm arrives, panicking the disciples, Jesus is sleeping, <laughs> sleeping in the back of the boat. This reminds me of a, another story in the Bible, a man named Jonah. Jonah, who when he is called to go west, gets on a boat and goes east as far as he can to get away from God. But this is on the Mediterranean Sea. This is on a big sea with big storms. And the professional sailors are terrified of this storm, so much so that these relatively godless men call out to their gods. It doesn't work. So they throw their payload, they throw their means of making a living overboard 
in hopes of saving themselves and their boat. That doesn't work. The captain of the ship goes down to the hold where Jonah is inexplicably sleeping through this violent storm. He wakes Jonah up and he tells him, call on your God. Maybe your God will save this ship. It does not work. So Jonah goes and tells the sailors that it is his fault. He is running away from God, and if they just pitch him overboard, everything will be all right. But these godless sailors will not do this. Instead, they, it says, the Bible says they row harder to try and get to the shore to no avail. So these godless sailors ask forgiveness before throwing Jonah overboard. And there is an immediate calm. Jesus is asked if he cares. And he gets up and he stills the storm. Do you care? There's a whole book of the Bible devoted to do you care? Perhaps you remember the man named Job, the most righteous who walked the earth. And yet even as the most righteous, he loses everything. He loses his animals. He loses his property. He loses his servants. He loses his family. He even loses his health. He spends 37 chapters with terribly unhelpful friends who accuse him of various things, and Job needs to defend himself. In fact, he defends himself against a God who does not care. I am a righteous man, O Lord. No one has walked the earth who has sinned less than I, and yet how does this befall me? Do you not care, O Lord? As a pastor, I hear versions of this story all the time. Usually it is people who have suffered a huge and immediate reversal in their lives, some tragedy. Or conversely, it is people who have lived on a slow decline and over so long finally get to a point where they have nothing in life. And they come and talk to a pastor trying to figure out why it is that this suffering has befallen them. And it is quite often that they will blame a God who does not care. Some will even curse God. It is quite a list in the Bible of people who claim that God does not care. Just a short list. Abraham, Moses, Job, Jonah... Mary, Martha, the disciples. Is it any wonder that we sometimes fall into a time of questioning, Lord, do you really care? When Jesus is asked if he cares, he gets up and he rebukes the wind and stills the storm. In Jonah, it takes throwing a man overboard to bring calm. For Jesus, it only takes a word. Peace, be still. Interesting to note in this story that Jesus never addresses the caring question. Instead, he turns it into a question of faith. After stilling the storm, he asks his disciples, Why, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? Late last summer and into a long fall, we at Bethel had a series of deaths, almost all of which were women, almost all of which were women of great faith. About two months ago, that corner turned. And in 2016, we have had a series of men of faith who have died men who have claimed the ultimate promises in Christ Jesus. Almost to a person, these many people over the last eight or nine months have been people of such faith. They have a conviction that this storm that is in their lives right now will soon give way to peace. It is almost as if Jesus is standing at their bedside saying, peace. Still. 
Does Jesus care? Is there any question about that? We are in a season of the church year in which we are called to pay rapt attention to the one who cares so much, cares so much, he goes to the cross and offers his life. Even if the disciples doubted him, Jesus goes to the cross for them. Even if the religious leaders condemn him, Jesus goes to the cross for them. Even if the people cry out for Barabbas, Jesus goes to the cross for them. Even if we wonder and question, even if we are angry with God, Jesus goes to the cross for us. Does Jesus care? Look at the cross. Jesus cares this much. Amen. Hymn 755, please rise and sing.